On a cold day in November, the citizens of Munich are going about their daily business. But today is no ordinary day, as thousands of armed radicals known as the Brown Shirts have taken to the streets. Even though the Great War is over, the German people live in a tense and uneasy atmosphere. Inflation has spiraled out of control, and it is not uncommon to see price tags with numbers in the trillions. It is only a matter of time before the situation reaches a critical point. Deutsches, 150 Milliarden Mark. Jetzt bitte, gib mir das Brot für meine Familie. Tut mir leid, Freund. Das ist alles, was du bekommst. Der Preis ist erst letzte Woche gestiegen. Was? Wie viel? Das ist mein ganzer Sport. Das soll doch wenigstens für ein paar Leute Brot reichen. Sehen Sie mal. Es ist, wie ich gesagt habe. Das war letzte Woche. Falls ich heute Brot habe, kostet es 200 Millionen. Morgen werden es 210 Milliarden sein. Und so weiter. Before we delve into this video, I'd like to take a moment to talk about today's sponsor. Call of War is a free online strategy game that allows you to rewrite the history of the Second World War alongside millions of users in a player versus player environment. Take control of one of the many countries spanning the globe. Then, join wars and team up with other players in real-time rounds that can last for weeks. This game strives to be historically accurate, yet still encourages the player to create their own path. But changing the course of history requires a powerful army and knowledge of the strengths and weaknesses of the dozens of units at your disposal. So choose your strategy carefully, then destroy your opponents employing everything from armored spearheads to air raids. You even have access to a secret research tree that can unlock atomic weapons and other deadly additions to your arsenal. Fight for world domination, conquer new land, and exert control over whole regions. Forge alliances with other players on both PC and mobile devices. And don't forget to sign up for new events each week, featuring additional maps, scenarios, and objectives. Click the link in the description below within the next 30 days and you'll unlock the amazing new player pack, which includes a month of high command and 13,000 gold. Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In this video, we will cover how Germany went from being saddled with debt and suffering the worst inflation in history to somehow conquering Europe all within the span of just 20 years. While the German National Socialist Party appeared to have brought the economy back on track, we'll also examine how in many ways it didn't. But first, we need to establish just what crippled the German economy, and that requires going further back to the ashes of the Great War, when all hope seemed lost. Shortly after the German surrender on the 11th of November 1918, a socialist uprising forced Kaiser Wilhelm II to abdicate without designating an heir. In the wake of this upheaval, the German monarchy was dismantled, and a new government, popularly referred to as the Weimar Republic, rose to take its place. This new government was forced to sign the humiliating Treaty of Versailles in June 1919. In addition to being forced to pay crippling war reparations, the industrial heartland of the nation was occupied and the German military was all but dismantled. Public perception of the new republic quickly became overwhelmingly negative, with many patriotic Germans blaming the revolution for their capitulation during the Great War, a national myth that would have devastating consequences further down the line. With virtually no industry and a population hostile to taxation, the Weimar Republic resorted to a solution dear to the hearts of economists everywhere, printing money to satisfy its debtors. Inevitably, this resulted in hyperinflation, and the German mark plummeted in value. At its lowest point in late 1923, a little over 4 trillion German marks was equivalent to a single US dollar. In the end, a desperate Germany appealed to the British and Americans for assistance, resulting in the enactment of the Dawes Plan. This plan introduced a new currency based on the gold standard called the Rentenmark, and loaned Germany a massive amount of money to restart its industrial sector. 
Under the Dawes plan, the Weimar Republic enjoyed a few years of relative stability and recovery, but in 1929, the Great Depression struck, and funding from the United States evaporated almost overnight. Worse still, Germany's creditors began rushing for repayments, plunging the country straight back into financial ruin. While a series of German chancellors like Franz von Papen and General Kurt van Sleicher were busy handling the fallout, a new political faction began to emerge, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or simply the Nazi Party. Founded in 1920, they preyed on middle-class fears of a communist uprising for support, and promoted an extremely antagonistic, anti-Semitic platform that demanded a racially pure Germany. Despite surging in elections and soon becoming the most popular party, the National Socialists lost 2 million votes in the Reichstag elections in 1932. Seeking to capitalize on this weakness, the conservative establishment within the Republic thought the time was now ripe to pacify this violent party by welcoming some of its leaders into power. Surrounded by conservative ministers and only having a handful of allies in cabinet positions, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler was appointed Reich Chancellor by President Paul von Hindenburg in January 1933. The conservative establishment thought they could control him for their own ends, but they couldn't have been more wrong. Suffice to say, Hitler and his movement could not be contained. The methods by which Hitler went from being essentially a lone chancellor surrounded by his opposition to having complete control of the government could warrant its own video. But soon enough, the Weimar Republic was no more, and the National Socialist Party was in full control. Using a new secret police force, the Nazis built a system of violent oppression and surveillance, attempting to silence dissent and unify the country towards one goal, war. With the outward display of public support, the Nazis first decided to tackle the unemployment problem. In reality, the next decade would merely see the expansion of the German military under the manipulative guise of repairing the economy. In some instances, instead of creating jobs, they simply distorted the numbers by encouraging young couples to get married through generous marriage loans, which removed women from the workforce. This reduced the pool of economically active people, thus creating the illusion of a falsely esteemed workforce. Other shady tactics, including counting part-time workers as fully employed or even classified classifying forced laborers and prisoners as full-time employees. Additionally, in accordance with Nazi racial policy, many Jews were forced out of their jobs or had their businesses confiscated and redistributed to non-Jewish businessmen who displayed loyalty to the party. This falsifiable image of economic recovery opened up new opportunities for non-Jewish Germans, but at the same time caused enormous suffering and hardship for those deemed undesirable. This isn't to say that there weren't job creation programs. The Nazis invested hundreds of millions of marks into various schemes to get the Germans back to work, and millions of Germans were now able to find full-time jobs in Hitler's new arms factories. But other job creation programs were far less traditional. Co-opting an existing labor program called the Voluntary Labor Service, the Nazis forced the unemployed or people receiving welfare benefits to volunteer for hard labor like farming or clearing earth for the state massive construction projects. Hundreds of thousands of Germans were forced to toil in abysmal conditions for lower pay than they were even receiving under the welfare program, and any who expressed complaints were sent to early forms of the concentration camps. And yet, to the Nazis, these suffering workers represented an encouraging statistic. By 1935, unemployment rates had plummeted to only 2 million people. But if you include the unemployment rate, the forced laborers, prisoners, and women taken out of the workforce by marriage loans, the actual unemployment rate stood at about double this figure. However rotten its foundation may have been, the German economy was growing. But it was not nearly enough to cover the amount the government was spending. Rather than temper their ambitions, the Nazis engaged in massive deficit spending to finance the programs they had in mind. German economists instituted a complicated new credit system called MIFO bills that allowed them to create and spend enormous amounts of cash while avoiding a new round of hyperinflation. These MIFO bills essentially acted like government bonds and allowed the Nazis to spend money that didn't really exist. This initially proved successful, but gradually collapsed over time. The German government was spending exorbitant amounts of money on rearmament and public works projects with the mindset that it would all be repaid by the plunder and land seizure of future conquests. They instituted no long-term economic plan and made no attempts to boost foreign trade 
or look beyond the coming war. As the national debt skyrocketed, the Nazis didn't stop to consider what would happen if they lost the war they had been banking on. Instead, they invested everything they had into ensuring they would win. Every subsidy and every investment made went into manufacturing and engineering at the almost complete abandonment of consumer goods. All of the Nazis' programs and initiatives, from job creation to public works to even their racial policies, were ultimately meant to serve the cause of rearmament. Perhaps one of the most famous public works launched during this time, the Autobahn Highway System, was no different. Financed in part by laws that granted a billion marks for infrastructure projects, the Autobahn was marketed as a massive modern highway system for the new German citizen to proudly tour his country behind the wheel of a shiny new car. Unsurprisingly, it also had another purpose. Hitler envisioned the highways of the Autobahn as the main arteries of a new military mobilization system. He pictured columns upon columns of panzers rolling down the roads protected by a thick concrete shell that towered over the highways and blocked air attacks. Contrary to his lofty vision, no concrete tunnels were ever built, and the roads proved too unstable for heavy tanks to roll along. Even the system under which the highways were laid out prevented them from having any use in military mobilization since the roads were too far away from any front line. Despite creating over 100,000 jobs and improving infrastructure, the Autobahn's true success was propagandistic. Hitler personally planned some routes to weave through the most picturesque views in Germany and insisted on the most modern bridge and road designs to project the image of a unified and idealistic state. But the government encountered a bump in the Autobahn. The average citizen couldn't afford a car, so who was going to use the new highway system in the first place? As a solution, Hitler imagined an affordable and cheaply produced vehicle known as the People's Car, or Volkswagen, that everyday citizens could purchase and drive through the new scenic highways through the beautiful German countryside. A mass advertising campaign and workers' payment program were launched to promote the car, and hundreds of thousands of laborers enthusiastically signed on. But as with so much during this period, everything ended up being used in service of the ultimate goal instead, rearmament. Despite 340,000 workers investing 110 million Reichsmarks into the car payment program, not one would actually receive a car. All of the funds collected by the People's Car Campaign went straight towards war spending. Car ownership in Germany did noticeably increase during this period, but the Autobahn was not nearly the success portrayed by Nazi propaganda. Even by 1939, railways remained the most common form of transport in the country. These years of spending on military rearmament did not go unnoticed. As Germany was not yet ready for war, Hitler had to fabricate a variety of excuses to justify the expansion of the armed forces to foreign powers. To the surprise of many, Germany was suddenly very interested in producing thousands upon thousands of innocent passenger planes and agricultural tractors. These vehicles only existed on paper, however. There was nothing innocent nor agricultural about the Messerschmitts and Panzers rolling off the assembly lines, or the rifles and howitzers emerging under the table from civilian manufacturers across the country. This disguised military buildup culminated in 1935 when mandatory conscription was passed, and by the end of the year, the army had grown to nearly 800,000 men, over eight times the maximum set by the Treaty of Versailles. With this act, the last of Germany's non-Jewish unemployed men were swept into military service, and unemployment was, on paper at least, fully eradicated. The result of all of this was that Germany entered the Second World War far better off than it had been at the end of the last Great War. The gross national product had surged to well over 100 billion Reichsmarks in 1939, from a low of 60 billion in 1932. And to all, it seemed that Germany had fully regained its strength. But while unemployment was down and manufacturing and capital were up, many of those so-called employed Germans were slaving away in a labor camp, and that capital was contingent on the complete success of the war. Further, the benefits from all of this economic success were skewed heavily towards those considered true Germans, and came at the expense of everyone else. Like the Autobahn unable to carry Hitler's tanks, the Nazi economy was shiny on the surface, but hollow at its core. <laughs>